I'd like to call the House Health Full Committee meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Representatives Boyd, Carringer, Clemens, Faison, Farmer, Gillespie, Hakeem, Hawk, Helton Haynes, Hemmer, Hicks of Hawkins, Hicks of Washington, Jernigan, Kumar, Martin, Mitchell, Rudder, Cheryl, Travis, Vaughn, Whitson, Williams, Vice Chairman Leatherwood, Here. Chairman Terry, Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. All right, thank you. And before we get started, do any of the members have any personal orders? No. Okay, uh, seeing none, I do want to make introduction. Uh, we have uh, a committee attorney that is with us for the first time this week, uh, Ms. Caroline Miller. And then uh, before we get started, I did want to make uh, an announcement, and it doesn't look like it'll be an issue today, hopefully, but just want to make sure that we keep the aisles and the doors clear at all times. Uh, and if it ever becomes an issue in this committee, we will ask the Sergeant Arms to reloc relocate individuals outside. Uh, and then we do have one of the bills that we have on the calendar today is going to have some testimony. And so it's uh, my goal for today and for every day in our committee to maintain decorum and have an open and honest debate. Um, I ask that members of the audience also maintain this decorum and refrain from any outbursts um, that might interrupt discussion. Um, again, if this becomes an issue, we may ask Sergeant Arms to relocate individuals outside. Um, members, we will not have any run running debates. I ask that uh, you be uh, recognized by me if you have any questions or comments. Um, and then, like I said, one of the bills on our calendar today, there are going to be eight people that are going to be testimony. And so it is my goal to give each person, they will have three minutes to testify. And at the conclusion of all them testifying, um, then we will ask the, uh, the members will have the opportunity to ask questions and bring somebody back up uh, to answer those questions at that point in time. Also would like to uh, make an announcement that uh, next week, we will have, uh, unless plans change, we'll have 10 care coming in to give their budget presentations. And then the following week, we will have the Department of Health coming in to give their budget presentation. And I know there's uh, a lot of interest on asking certain questions of both departments. And so uh, fair game will be at that, uh, at that meeting as well. So we do have a calendar. And so we will get with item number one. House Bill 66. I think uh, Representative Butler, you are recognized. You have a motion and a second. Thank you, Chairman. This is a very simple bill. Uh, I do have to point out uh, Representative Martin's um, very uh, patriotic UT attire today. That kind of caught my eye. <laughs> it kind of stands out. So anyway, uh, House Bill 66, a very simple bill. Executive Order 10, signed by Governor Lee, transition the Tennessee Early Intervention System from the program from the Tennessee Department of Education to the Dennis Tennessee Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And so what this bill does is simply streamline government. We're moving it from the Department of Education over to the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And it just simply streamlines the government and avoids having any duplication in government services. All right. Do we have any questions for the sponsor of the bill? Uh, seeing none, before uh, uh, Chairman Williams, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, Representative Butler, uh, I know this was asked of you in the subcommittee, but I thought since we do have the chairman of, from the District of Champions here today, if this was your first bill. Yes, Chairman, it is. Thank you. And um, thank you. And before we vote on this bill, I do want to make sure you, you are introduced to the uh, chairman of that committee. And uh, he will, um, when he get when you get to the House floor, if you get this bill to the House floor, uh, he he will ask you some pertinent and maybe some not so pertinent questions <laughs> on this bill. So, all right. Without uh, objection, we are voting on House Bill 66. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to Thank calendar you. and rules. All right, that brings us to item number two, House Bill 64. Chairman Hawk, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, I'll give a motion on the bill. Motion, motion second. 
your property rec recognized. Thank you very much. Many of you will remember we've put forth the TANF Tennessee Opportunity Act in recent years, and we have created and formulated uh, through an advisory council a tremendous program that's going to bring seven different pilot organizations across the state of Tennessee to formulate new programs. And we're looking to measure the effectiveness of these programs. And in setting these up, the advisory council has recognized we're going to need an extra year to get a report back to the legislature. And I sit on that advisory council as well, by the way. So in the original law, we had put forth uh, getting a, a report to the General Assembly by December 31 of 2025. We're going to need an extra year just to get these programs up and running and measure the effectiveness. So uh, number one, the bill will extend the, uh, the deadline for a report to uh, December 31st of 2026. It gives us one more year to gather data and measure data. As well, present law uh, requires the Department of Human Services to within a 12 month period following the end of each fiscal year to obligate all the unspent TANF funds out to community programs. This is gonna give us instead of that 12 month window an 18 month window to get those funds distribute out to uh, community programs. In a nutshell, it does those two things, Mr. Chairman and members. All right. Thank you. And I guess, yeah, um, to further your point, we basically, uh, when, when the bill passed, we had an ambitious timeline. And as we've gotten into work, we realized we need a more reasonable timeline. And that's what this does. Uh, Representative Akeem, you're recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask, if I could, uh, two or three questions here. One, uh, the funding we're talking about, we're talking about, I guess the way I'm reading this is we're going to push this money on out. And I'm saying what uh, the, the rules, the guardrails for monies of this nature, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at, we, we're not going to just push it out and let sort of just to say we got it out. Is it going to be a part of the uh, inside the guardrails of what we already have in place? Okay. Chairman Hawk, you recognize him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are numerous guardrails in place to make sure this is done right, what the right way. And in addition to that, the measurement tools that we're putting in place to see if we are actually having an impact on families is what's one of the critical pieces of this. And, and that's what's going to take a little more time to create those measurements. So, yes, all the go, go guard rules are in place uh, as they have been before. Okay. Representative King. Uh, yes. Um, are we are we going to have reports? I think I heard that we're going to have a report in 2025 or 2026. I, I guess if a program needs to be adjusted along the way, uh, are we going to have any information on that or we, we wait until 2025, 2026? Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will say that the Department of Human Services, along with this Families First Community Advisory Board that we have organized with seats from all across the state of Tennessee, we are an active bunch. And if something is, is not meeting the expectations, uh, and I've had this conversation with Senator Watson as well, uh, along with Senator, or Representative Terry. Sorry, I gave you the motion there, Chairman Terry. Uh, but along with uh, Chairman Terry, we've had these discussions to ensure that we're headed the right direction. These pilot programs have been vetted and vetted and vetted and vetted one more time uh, to ensure that they're in it for the right reasons and doing the right thing. If a problem does pop up, we are going to know about it, and, and we will in turn share that with the General Assembly if there is an issue. Okay, one last Rick, question. You're good. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. The We have seven, I'm going to say, entities across the state. Uh, do we have one for Southeast Tennessee and who serves on the advisory board for Southeast Tennessee? Sure, uh, Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The original law that set forth the Tennessee Opportunity Act indicated that we would have representation amongst grand divisions uh, for the pilot programs. And it was set forth, it, it worked out that each grand division would be, um, would be, have the opportunity to be awarded two pilot programs. And then there would be one with 
somewhat of a statewide application that Department of Human Services would uh, would would offer up to be the seventh pilot program. Uh, each of the each of the uh, entities put forth, I think there was in the 30s, mid 30s or so, the number of entities who put forth plans that were all given discernment and vetted and vetted and vetted once again, as, as I had mentioned before. Uh, and the six regional uh, pilot programs were decided upon using a fairly extensive matrix that scored all the aspects and all the, the pros and cons of those programs. I can't recall exactly if Southeast Tennessee was what, what where they scored, but I don't think they got into the final six. In terms of representation on the committee, and there may be others, and, and we can, I, I can get names, but I know Senator Watson is on the advisory council with me as well. So Senator Watson is on the advisory council. I'm sure there there is other representation from the private sector and the public sector as well there, but Senator Watson's name comes to mind first. Okay. That, that created you're, another you're question, Mr. Uh, does that mean that Southeast Tennessee is not a part of the process or are we lumped in with someone else? You recognize. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to make sure I get this this right. There are there are regional pilot programs in each grand division. I don't want to say that Southwest Virginia is unserved because they're still being served throughout some of the processes. They may not be part of this particular pilot. What the pilot programs themselves are, we're trying to think outside the box and find innovative ways to help individuals. Although Southeast Tennessee organization may not have been one of those that was awarded a $25 million grant over a three-year time frame, they are still very much participating in the TANF program and the Families First program to get those dollars in and again, get those dollars out toward helping families. So we're looking for innovative ways and, and what we asked for were innovative ways to reach families that are going to be measured in detail. Southeast Tennessee is still participating in the TANF programs to the degree that they have before and probably even more so with the additional dollars that are being made available, but they were not one of the six pilots that was chosen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Any, Thank you. Any further questions for the sponsor? Okay. Seeing none. We are voting on House Bill 64. All those in favor of House Bill 64 say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to finance, ways, and means. All right, that brings us to item number three on our calendar, House Bill 1. Leader Lambert, you are recognized. You have a motion and a second. Hey, Mr. Chairman, there's an amendment that makes the bill. It is coded 003694. Okay, you have a motion and a second on amendment 003694. If you can give us a brief description, then we can get that bill in proper form. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, this addresses some of the issues that came up in the subcommittee that some of the members had asked about, um, dealing with some cleanup language and then specifically with the section on abuse and neglect. All right. Without objection, let's uh, get the bill in uh, proper form for debate. So all those in favor of uh, Amendment 3694 say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, we're back on the bill as amended. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Members of the committee, I, I know you have several folks here that wish to testify. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you wish, I can reserve any of my comments till after we hear from the people of Tennessee, if you'd like. Okay. Uh, if there is no objection, uh, we have some folks here that would like to testify. And so without objection, let's uh, go out of session. Okay. Um, we, like I said, we have eight members. Uh, first on our list is a Mr. Matt Walsh. Okay. If you can, for the record, uh, state your name and who you're with, and you will have three minutes. My name is uh, Matt Walsh. I'm here as a husband, father, and concerned citizen of the state of Tennessee. And I want to thank the committee for allowing me to speak and for all of you on the committee who support this important legislation. 
Now, I know that we can't agree on very much these days, but we should be able to agree that our most solemn responsibility as individuals, as a state, and as a country is to protect our children. We should be able to agree that children do not have the physical, emotional, or mental capacity to protect themselves or to make life-altering decisions. We should be able to agree that it's never okay to chemically castrate, sterilize, butcher, or mutilate a child. And in fact, all decent people do agree on all these points. But many of the people who hold power in this country and who run our institutions, including our medical institutions, do not pass this basic test of decency. They've made House Bill 1 not only necessary, but one of the most important pieces of legislation this body has ever taken into consideration. In service to a radical far-left agenda, children are being led down a path of gender confusion and identity crisis. This crisis, manufactured by the culture, is then exploited and monetized by medical professionals who first put them on chemical castration drugs like Lupron. Then the victims are given cross-sex hormones, which often have irreversible and permanent effects. Finally, before the age of 18, many of these kids will undergo surgery, such as double mastectomies, which will alter their bodies and their lives forever, taking something away that they can never get back, no matter how much they regret it in the future, and so many do. This is happening across the country, and that includes in our state. Children are being coerced into decisions that they are not equipped to make in pursuit of a goal that, they, that can never be attained. The girl who gets the double mastectomy is no closer to being a boy after getting the procedure than she was before. She's still a girl and will always be a girl, just now a mutilated and damaged one. Now, you may notice that most of the people who support and advocate for this butchery are not petitioning to lower the drinking age. They're not trying to pass a law to allow middle schoolers to get tattoos or take out mortgages or purchase firearms or cigarettes. That's because even they recognize that minors lack the maturity and discernment required to make those choices. They recognize that when it comes to alcohol and tobacco and guns and mortgages and tattoos, yet when it comes to irreversible life-altering medical interventions, suddenly these same people discover a newfound confidence in the responsible decision-making powers of children. Their position is not even consistent or coherent, much less morally or scientifically defensible. We cannot allow this wickedness to continue. We cannot tolerate it. We are decent and rational people in this state. We love our children. We recognize basic truths. One of those basic truths is that a child who is confused about her identity needs guidance and love and clarity. She does not need hormone injections and scalpels. She needs, she needs and deserves to be protected from those child abusing quacks and soulless vultures who wish to exploit her confusion for their own gain. That's why we need this law. Our kids cannot protect themselves, but we can, and we must, and we are. Thank you. All right, thank you, and if you will uh, uh, stay in the uh, committee room, there may be questions afterwards. Uh, second on our list is uh, uh, Jenny Bailey. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, maybe e either one is, but uh, make sure the mic is on and uh, Leader Lambert can probably help you. Just for the record, record tell us your name and who you're with. Thank you. In three Good minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Terry, Vice Chairman Leatherwood, and members of the committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Jenny Bailey. I am a former president and current board member of PFLAG Franklin. PFLAG is an organization of LGBTQ plus people, parents, families, and allies who work together to create an equitable and inclusive world. Founded in 1973, PFLAG is thousands of people and hundreds of chapters from coast to coast who are leading with love to support families, educate allies, and advocate for just, equitable, and inclusive legislation and policies. There are coordinated outside forces working to change our state laws and remove Tennesseans' liberties to get the health care our kids need when they need it. Today, I'm here to ask you to support your constituents by keeping government out of doctor's offices. Protect transgender kids in Tennessee, just like you do every child in the state. Please vote no on HB1 for the sake of trans kids and their families who love them. I'm here today representing two Middle Tennessee families who have transgender children but did not feel safe to come before you themselves. The first story is from a father. He has spent his entire life as an educator in Middle Tennessee. He states, as an elementary school teacher and then high school administrator, I know the importance of providing students with safe, stable, nurturing environments that establishes the trust needed to assist with learning. About five years into his tenure as principal, his middle schooler came out to him as trans. He says, 
Growing up is hard enough when someone feels comfortable with who they are. Please don't make it more difficult when someone knows who they are but are not allowed to show it. The second story is from a mother. From early in her child's life, there were persistent indicators that her child, born with male genitals, saw herself as a girl from the toys and games she chose to the clothes she chose. When the child got to middle school, she told her parents she was transgender. At this point, the parents did their own research and worked to support their daughter as best they could. Quoting the mother now, she says, our child immediately began to flourish. However, my beloved Tennessee, where my family has lived for generations, where I have devoted my entire adult career to investing in children's health and well-being, is also where the leadership hates me and they hate my child simply for existing. Thank you for the opportunity to present these life stories to you. I'd like to give you a copy for the record, if that's okay. At PFLAG Franklin, we hear stories like these every month in our support meetings from parents and grandparents who love their children and want desperately to do right by them and to keep them alive. Please vote no on this copy-paste bill from outsiders and fear mongers. Vote no to protect Tennesseans. It will be a vote that is pro-life. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any materials, you can send those to my office. Um, next on our list, and then please again stay in the auditorium or stay in the committee hearing room in case we have some questions. Uh, next on our list is Landon Starbuck. And again, for the record, uh, speaking to the microphone, uh, tell us your name and who you're with. I'm Landon Starbuck. Um, I'm here today as an advocate for children harmed by medical exploitation and gender mutilation. May I proceed? Yes, please. Many families have looked to my nonprofit for help finding support and resources where there are little to none available outside of the affirmative care model, which tells children that if they don't fit into stereotypical, often misogynistic gender norms, that they are born in the wrong body. One of the most abusive, destructive lies you could tell a child is that something is physically wrong with them just because they like different colors, toys, hairstyles, or hobbies. All children are unique and don't need to be on drugs and be surgically altered to solve a mental health issue. They need therapy. They need to be told you are not a mistake. Your body structure does not dictate or define your ability to live a happy, healthy life. Feelings are not forever. The majority of children suffering from gender dysphoria have at least one mental health related comorbidity. Many of them have experienced sexual abuse and trauma, but instead of using standard therapy based interventions, kids are being fast tracked to puberty blockers and hormones without true informed consent. Doctors and therapists fear losing their license if they don't comply with the so-called gender affirmative model, and no doctor should be coerced into treatments they deem harmful and scientifically unsound. In some states, if a parent affirms their child's true sex, they can have their children removed by CPS and even go to jail for five years in Canada. One young American girl was removed from her family because they refused to affirm her as a boy. Her mental health issues went unaddressed, she was separated from her family, and her vulnerabilities made her a target for trafficking. She was trafficked not once, but two times. This is one example showing the most dangerous outcomes of teaching kids to keep secrets from their parents, separating families, and transferring power to medical institutions who have a billion dollar financial incentive. We're here because an, ideolo an ideology based on social theory has been unethically medicalized for profit and grave human rights abuses are being committed against children. So-called gender-based medicine is actually lifelong dependency on the medical institution and pharmaceutical companies. There's no consensus and there's no ethical experiment theor uh, theor based on theories on children, especially when the experiments include dangerous medications used off-label with zero long-term safety studies, no empirical studies, and children left with lifelong debilitating irreversible side effects. Puberty blockers are not fully reversible. If a child goes on puberty blockers for five years, those critical years of development are gone. Their bones don't gain any density, boys' genitals don't grow, girls' breasts don't grow, and their pelvises don't expand. Dr. Marcy Bowers, a sex change surgeon, admitted during a Duke University meeting recently that she doesn't know of a single male that was able to achieve orgasm after their medical transition. We're talking about children here, minors, their future intimate relationships, their fertility, their sexual function obliterated. The pro-mutilation activists argue that it's about affirming a child's identity, but yet children are encouraged to have a sex change before they've even had a chance to develop their including sexual development. Thorough follow-up studies based in Sweden of trans adults show that 10 to 15 years after sex reassignment surgery. Yes. That's three minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Thank you. And if you, again, can stick around, we may have some questions uh, for you. All right, next on our list is Vaniel Simmons. Is there Vaniel Simmons? Right, thank you for joining us today. If you can, for the record, uh, tell us your name and who you're with in the microphone, and then we'll start your clock. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Vaniel Simmons. Um, I'm a youth advocate at Out Memphis, um, and I am a current student studying psychology and gender and sexuality studies at Rhodes College. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for hearing me today. Um, I am testifying against House Bill 1 on the grounds of my personal and professional experience. I understand and respect your hesitancy and concern regarding the surgeries, but I am testifying today asking you to reconsider the ban on hormones and puberty blockers. I ask you this as a transgender individual who underwent gender affirming care as a minor. Two years ago, I would have been impacted by this bill being heard today. At the age of 14, I was confident in my trans identity and I came out to all of my friends. I conducted my own research and I had to wait until I was 16 in order to seek medical treatment. Before my first appointment with the gender clinic, I was asked to supply a referral letter from a therapist during which, and later during the appointments with the gender clinic, my mother, grandmother, and I all underwent psychological evaluations to ensure that we collectively understood and were confident in the decision to go on hormone replacement therapy. After, we were, after I was approved for replacement hormone treatment, um, there was an additional six month waiting period, which is standard practice at the clinic to be certain that, this clinic, that the patients continuously presented dysphoria over that period of time. In summary, it was almost three years between the time that I came out as trans until I was able to receive gender affirming treatment. For myself and others in this situation, the waiting was literal absolute torture. Um, I woke up each day hating myself and I went to bed wanting it all to end. It felt as if I was constantly fighting tooth and nail just to stay alive and I wasn't sure that I was going to make it to 18. One question that's been previously asked in discussions of this bill is what is the harm in waiting until the child is 18 to make the decision? I respond that there is a very specific type of pain in knowing that there's treatment available that will help you to see yourself as you are and for other people to see you as you are and being denied the right to access that treatment. Um, the time before medically transitioning was a social and mental torture for me. I couldn't make medical, I couldn't make meaningful friendships and I wasn't being perceived as the person that I was, something that hurt more than the words could say. I didn't feel like I could make friends because it was inauthentic and I even became more distant with my family. They weren't becoming friends or learning more about me as a person. They were learning about a false shell that they were perceiving. Since beginning hormones and later, and later surgically transitioning, I've been more confident and more at ease at myself and more able to communicate and advocate with my peers. My grandmother remarked um, after I began medically transitioning that she now goes to bed every night listening to me laughing and talking with my friends, which is something that she don't, doesn't think that she'd ever heard before. She couldn't comprehend the impact that gender affirming care had for me until she was able to actually see it play out. The bill that is currently being heard will ban all healthcare for trans youth, surgical intervention, hormones, and puberty blockers. The cost of waiting is torture, and I have seen it time and time again in my own story, my peer story, and the peers, or in the stories of trans teens that I have worked with, as well as in the stories, statistics, and research that I have been a part of in college. Right. Mr. Want... Simmons, that's three minutes. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next on our list is Dr. Omar Hamada. And for the record, talking to, uh, tell us who you are on the microphone and who you're with. Hi, I'm Dr. Omar Hamada. I'm a board certified OBGYN and family physician, uh, also with a specialization in sports medicine from 10 years combat service in the U.S. Army Special Forces, um, also uh, with a theology degree from seminary. Um, Pew Research Forum last year um, came out with a poll that said that the transgender population in America makes up 0.3% of those who are 50 years and older. It makes up 1.6% of those 30 to 49 years of age and 5.1% of those 30 years and younger. What this demonstrates is that our society has seen a 17x increase within a single generation. The number of those identifying as transgender between 13 and 24 years of age has doubled in the past five years. Scholars believe that this radical increase is due to a number of factors, such as intentional grooming and desensitization, coupled with the added power of suggestion in this precocious age group. 
We see that in this society in general, with grooming of our children through popular video games like SimCity, and even here in various county school systems, even in Williamson County, where kindergartners and elementary schools are sent home with birthday books, which have non-binary primary characters to be read and then returned with a nameplate uh, dedicated to that child whose birthday it is. Acceptable medical practice has long held that the treatment of psychological and emotional disorders is psychotherapy in its many forms, as well as antidepressant, antipsychotic, and anxiolytic medications. Never before have we insisted that irreversible and permanent medical and surgical mutilation of a child's physical sexual characteristics be part of this equation during this very volatile time in their lives. Aside, uh, aside from the surgical mutilation of children, many advocate puberty blockers and sex hormone use to begin the transition from one gender to another. These medications, when given to pubertal children, do significant physical and psychological damage. Many of the effects are reversible, but many are not. Today, our European counterparts in the UK, Finland, and Sweden, who are all well ahead of us in these areas, have begun to put the brakes on as they see more and more resultant problems than benefits. Gender transition surgeries for adolescents have increased fivefold between 2016 and 2019. In the past, gender transitions were very rare. Most adolescents with gender discordance resolve themselves within a matter of a few years. However, once gender affirming care, so to speak, has started, the likelihood of completion is much greater, though many come to regret it. And here's the kicker. Over and over, we have seen that there is no reliable evidence that these treatments result in improved mental health, decreased rates of suicide, or increased sense of self-worth or identity over the long term, or that the benefits of transitioning minors outweigh the very significant medical, surgical, and psychological risks. It is true that this group is more susceptible to suicide than the baseline population, but this does not change with transitioning. There's no scientific support that gender corrective surgery reduces the risk. I do not like the idea of a legislative body dictating medical treatment. However, in this case, when we have failed as physicians in a society, uh, it's up to you to um, mandate such protections to our children. Thank you. Thank you, and if, uh, again, if you'd stick around in case the panel has, or the committee has some questions. Uh, next on our list is uh, Mr. Greg Schweiger. Thank you, and again, and uh, for the record, uh, tell us uh, your name and, and who you're with. We have three minutes. I'm Greg Schweiger. I'm the dad of a transgender son. Thank you. I grew up the youngest of six on a Kansas farm where we went to mass every Sunday. My dad was a career farmer who served on the school board of the Ruritans and was a 30-year volunteer fire chief. He showed me that service to others is necessary to support a healthy family and community. Now, I'm the proud dad of a transgender son in Tennessee. On the evening our son came out to us, I immediately told him I loved him, no matter what. Then I asked what he needed. Our first job was to help him socially transition, change his name, speak with family, friends, and to school. Secondly, we sought help from the team of healthcare professionals, including pediatricians, gastroenterologists, and endocrinologists, dermatologists, and nurse specialists, and dedicated psychologists. We researched best practices, and we trusted the medical experts who had the best interests at heart. This complex, years-long process took time for listening, learning, consultation, therapy, community, and many, many thousands of dollars. All of these things we gave freely with love. And through all of this, I never wavered. I, I do what all dads should do, fight for the child, provide for them, and be the best dad possible. Today, my son is a brilliant, successful college junior, which, not would, which would not have been possible without his gender-affirming care. HB1 will force trans kids and their families like mine into darkness with no medicine, no expert help, and will cause nothing but pain, suffering, and death. From the beginning, we were 100% supportive and loving our, of, in our son's journey. Still, that took time, intention, patience, and included a long series of medical experts who could not do their job, their well-researched, life-saving best practices when this bill passes, I cannot fathom where my son would be today if he did not have the access to health care he did. It breaks my heart. I think back 
to what I learned from my upbringing, what it means to be a dad, what it is my responsibility to protect a child, help him become the best person that he can be, and to ensure that there is a supportive community so that he and others like him can thrive. But here I am in front of those who falsely claim to be servants of Tennessee, yet spend a questionable amount of time trying to hurt the most vulnerable children. I cannot understand how anyone, especially the dads in this room, can work to pass laws that will only bring pain and suffering to children and families. Because to me, strong, loving dads fight to protect their family and their community for everyone. I'm telling you as a dad, do not destroy families with HB1. Let's support each other. Don't let Tennessee be a place where children have to be resilient and strong and brave just to be themselves. All right. Thank you, Mr. Schwager. Time is up. If, again, if you can stick around, we may have questions. Thank you for, for your testimony. Uh, next is uh, Prisha Mosley. And again, thank you uh, for coming. If you can tell us who you are and, and uh, who you're with, and then uh, you, we'll have three minutes. All right. Um, my name is Prisha. I'm uh, with myself testifying on behalf of gender nonconforming children. I'm testifying today as someone who has, was transitioned as a child. As a detransitioned adult, I recognize the importance that civil action laws like this would provide in holding the people accountable who did this to me as a child and preventing other children from being harmed. When I was 15, I was 15 years old when I learned about gender ideology from the trans community. At 17, I was being medicalized with a high dose of testosterone. One year later, my healthy breasts were cut off. I had pre-existing diagnoses of anorexia nervosa, anxiety, panic disorder, major depression, and borderline personality disorder. I also experienced a sexual assault at 14, which I was under the impression only happened to girls. These other conditions and issues were all put to the side when I uttered the word gender. My therapist even attested that all of my problems were caused by being born in the wrong body. This wasn't true, but I was medicalized anyway. I was deemed stable and well despite multiple recent suicide attempts, active cutting, and severe malnutrition. During the time of my transition, I also asked my doctors for liposuction. They told me no because I was too well to have an elective cosmetic surgery, but decided I was healthy enough to have my breasts removed. Now at 24, I have two huge scars where my breasts should be and no sensation but the occasional zapping pain I feel. My body is disproportionate, causing me to be clumsy and ugly. I have no hips and large shoulders. My neck, back, and shoulders constantly burn from the overgrowth. My throat is sore, and I can no longer sing or raise my voice, jeopardizing my safety and taking my joy. I have suffered hair loss as well as hair growth on my body, which I have to treat with laser hair removal. My muscles and joints ache. I decided that I did not want to be a woman before I had ever gotten to be one. I was a little girl. Now I will never fully know what that is like. I fully support a bill that protects youth from the undeniable harm caused by so-called gender affirmative care. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, if you can please stay, um, there may be questions for you. Thank you. And last on our list is an Elliot Atwood. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as with everybody else, uh, tell us who you are and who you're with. And once you do that, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, my name is Elliot Atwood. I'm here on behalf of myself and other transgender youth in this state, um, along with my mother. I'm 17 years old. I attend a public high school in Williamson County. I'm actually from Mr. Whitson's district. By most measures, I'm a pretty average kid. I love shop class. I hate homework. I sing in the men's choir at my school. Well, because like any kid from Tennessee, music is my life. I've got a pretty good group of friends too. We're small, but we're like a family. I'm a happy guy. But my life wasn't always as cheerful. In my freshman year of high school, on the second day of school, I came out as transgender. I had known about this, I'd known this about myself for a while, my whole life really, and I knew that it was time to share that side of me with my classmates. Things were rocky, to say the least. 
a lot of people had never met a transgender person. It took time for things to get better. I kept to myself, I minded my business, and people learned to do the same. I've wanted to start my medical transition for a while. There are a lot of steps to getting a prescription in Tennessee, especially when you're a minor like myself. My parents were very hesitant in the beginning, as were my doctors. But by the time I turned 17, my, my parents were starting to come around. All of the doctors in my area had stopped accepting new patients out of fear from this bill. The process is a slow one and providers are cautious. I've known who I am for most of my life and still I've not been able to access this type of medical care. Medical decisions, especially ones as delicate and important as a medical transition should be between myself, my parents and my doctors. I only ask that the state of Tennessee continues to allow me the normal life I deserve as a resident. I'm gonna be 18 soon, and this law won't affect me. But I can't help but worry for the teenagers out there, my friends who are just as I was. Will they even make it to 18? I ask you to vote no on this bill. You think that you're protecting people like me, but you aren't. You're hurting your constituents. Taking away our medical care won't prevent us from being transgender, but it could prevent us from being safe, healthy, and happy. I thank you for your time. Thank you, and uh, appreciate all those that testified today. And uh, we may have some questions here. I believe, um, Chairman Faison, do you have a quest question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And who, who, who would this be directed to? Would you like to come up? If I could ask. Mr. Walsh. Okay. Mr. Walsh, uh, if you would mind. Uh... Matt, thank you for being here. You're recognized. Just a quick question for you. We've heard in the news last week and even today that it's pro-life to vote against this bill. We've heard that um, suicides are prevalent and uh, suicide has impacted my family, so I'm sensitive when I hear something like that. I, I, I've, I've read some of the stuff that you've done, and I was wondering, can you speak to the statistics of, of uh, mental health and suicidal tendencies for the people who have gone through transition or for people who have not? In your studies, from what I've read, can you, can you speak to that? Mr. Sure. Walsh, you recognize <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, the claim that uh, you know doing the chemical castration drugs or surgery or hormonal intervention, the claim that this prevents suicide or uh, has uh, positive psychological effects down the line is utterly, totally baseless. Um, there are no credible long-term studies that bear that out. And one of the reasons for that is that there couldn't possibly be any credible long-term studies because we've never done this to kids on this scale ever before in history. So this current, uh, shall we say, crop of children, they are the guinea pigs. This is, this is all experimental. We're sort of trying it out on them to see if it works. Um, now, they have attempted a few times to do studies. And the interesting thing is that the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, WPATH, which is a radical far-left pro-trans organization, they commissioned a study to try to prove that, um, that hormones and puberty blockers uh, uh, decrease suicide rates among uh, trans, uh, trans-identified youth. And even in their own study, they found that they couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't prove it. They couldn't make that link because it's just not possible to do. The other thing I would mention, too, is that, you know, the, the, the number of trans-identified youth has skyrocketed in recent years. We're talking about exponential 10x, 20x growth. Just huge numbers have, 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 uh, have, have increased. And what we hear from the pro-trans side is that, uh, well, this is not a social contagion. It's just that you know, there's always been this many trans people. It's just that they were not in an affirming uh, environment before in history, and so they couldn't come out. And now, for the first time, trans people uh, have, have the ability to live their truth, so to speak. Well, if that's the case, and there have always been these sort of like millions of trans people, and if it's also true that if we don't affirm them, that it would cause them to commit suicide, then we should be able to look back in history and find just this unbroken, incredible epidemic of children mysteriously killing themselves because they weren't being affirmed as trans. And what you find is that that didn't exist. I mean, the, the, the youth suicide rate has increased exponentially alongside trans affirmation. 
So trans affirmation causes the suicide rate, not the other way around. Last thing I'll note is that um, the suicide rate among trans-identified people is, is sky high. It remains sky high. All the data shows this. It remains sky high even after surgery. And in fact, in the most reliable data that we have, it's uh, years after surgery when suicidality is the highest for trans-identified people. That's the reality. Mr. President, you're good. Okay. Any further questions for Mr. Walsh while we're out of session? Uh, Mr. Hammer, uh, Representative Hammer. Thank you. Um, I found it, uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. I found it interesting. One of our uh, um, people uh, testified today that they uh, had their gender affirming surgery at 16. And I know uh, you in former comments mentioned uh, this uh, on your blog. At about 16, you're an adult who's mature and can make decisions. Uh, you're that at 16. I don't care what anybody says, even going so far as to say, you know, 16 people, uh, when you're 16, you should be married and uh, and could be pregnant or should be pregnant. Um, so I'm curious if 16 is uh, a uh, an adult in your view. Uh, why does this bill have uh, the uh, minor de defined as 18? Uh, Mr. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's that's a hit piece you took from Media Matters uh, from something when I was a, a radio host. Uh, 13, 14 years ago, my early 20s. Uh, it's also not an accurate reflection of what I actually said. Um, I was talking about uh, the fact that people tended to marry young historically, and that's all that that was about. Um, how does that relate to, the, to this subject? Just curious to your definition of, of if you feel like people are adults at 16, should well, people uh, are adults should at 18. Uh, but actually, your your brain is not fully developed until you're 25. So we should be having a conversation about whether we should even be doing these surgeries to people at 18. But certainly before 18, it's it's absurd. I mean, do you do you do you think that a 16 year old can meaningfully consent to having their body parts removed? Do do you? No. We do not. Yeah, we ask the questions. It's not. It's uh, okay. Representative Hammer, you are recognized. No more questions. Okay, uh, Representative Clemens, you are recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you give us a summary of your educational background or your healthcare education experience? M Mr. Walsh, you are recognized. My experience in healthcare. Your educational background. I'm just curious. You 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 yeah. testified as to a lot of your own research. So I'm curious for what purpose you do that and what background you have to qualify you to speak to that. Well, my Mr. background Walsh. that qualifies me to speak to this is that I'm a human being with a brain and common sense, and I have a soul. And so, therefore, I think it's a really bad idea to chemically castrate children. That is my experience. Um, also, I I did. Now it's true. I didn't I didn't go to college, but I did go to school long enough to learn how to read. So I can read the data for myself, and that's exactly what I've done. Representative Clemens, you're right. And for what purpose do you um, conduct your research and use this brain of yours? Mr. Walsh, you're recognized. I use it for the purpose of trying to protect children from being castrated and mutilated. That's one of the things I try to do. You don't use it Clemens. to... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You don't use it to get clicks on your Let's state publication? Or well, are you using it right now to try to get clicks with this interaction? On. No. I, 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 I really like the Mr. idea Walsh. of getting uh, of, of drawing attention to the fact that this is happening to children. I know you seem to find it very amusing. I don't. Uh, Representative Clements. Well, you made a lot of misrepresentations and, and category characterizations in your comments. So I think it's fair to, for me to question your background. What are I and your base? Let me finish, please. You recognize Representative Clements. You know, if you're going to come before a committee and make mischaracterizations and misrepresentations, it's fair game for us to ask you your educational background and your foundational knowledge for making such characterizations. That's that's my point. So I'm curious about you speaking to the development of the human brain at, by the age of 25. I seem to recall you advocating on behalf of firearm possession at the age of 18. Do you think that's let's, appropriate? Let's stay on the bill, please. That's all I got. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, can I respond to that? Representative Mitchell, you're recognized. I can't respond to what Representative yeah, Mitchell is th recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, you know, you, I think your original article, blog post, or tweet, or whatever, 
kind of started this firestorm. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, where we need to look for these surgeries because I'm still trying to find, you know, the surgeries because, you know, the the sponsor of the bill last week, I kind of agreed with him. I said, we need to split this bill into two parts. You know, I may agree with him on the surgery part because I don't think it's happening. So, you know, you seem to have started this. So I need your evidence of where these surgeries are occurring in Tennessee. Could you could you give me, you know, places, times, maybe some names uh, or something that, you know, yeah. you, you know of? Mr. Yeah, my, Walsh, Mr. Walsh, you're recognized. My evidence is the healthcare provider's own words. You know, I I, uh, I outlined Vanderbilt Health and their uh, transgender care um, program and the people that work for that program, their own words, talking about what they do and talking about, for example, um, providing the chemical castration drugs to, to adolescent children. Um, as far as surgeries, you know, double mastectomies do happen. And the way that I know that they happen is that after I called attention to this program at Vanderbilt, they said that they were going to stop performing. They were going to put a pause on the program that performs these surgeries on minors. And so if you're pausing the program that performs surgeries on minors, then I'm going to assume that the program existed. Otherwise, you couldn't have paused it. So now the exact number of uh, kids who are being subjected to this, I, I don't know exactly. It's really hard to come up with those numbers, I think, because the people doing it aren't really proud of it. And it's, they, there's not a lot of interest on their end to tell us. But I do think that, you know, even one child being horrifically mutilated is too many. So I know that it's more than one. And that's reason enough to put a stop to this, I would say. Representative Mitchell, you recognize that? Yeah. So, so last week I had an amendment that, you know, we're looking to protect children from abuse. And I also had an amendment to stop cosmetic surgery of rhinoplasty and breast enhancements to minors. How would you feel about that? You know, sure. is that mutilation of children as well under the age of 18? They can't Representative, think for themselves. Representative Mitchell, that's not on uh, the bill that we have. Yeah, it is. It's surgical. I, it's surgical. I, I'm happy to answer that. You are free to answer, Mr. Walls. Okay. Uh, my personal feeling about banning breast enhancements for, for minors? Yeah. Yes, I, I would be all for, personally, I'd be all for banning that. Absolutely. Yeah. Representative Mitchell. Okay. And, and so I think the previous representative, you know, proved that you have no medical background, correct? Uh, no. So, so you're here probably just as a public policy. You, you're trying to address good public policy, correct? Or Mr. Walsh. Yes. So I just have to question, you know, some of your public policy, you know, expertise when, you know, I'm reading here, Singapore is able to have nice things in part because they execute drug dealers by hanging and arrest even petty vandals and thieves and beat them with a cane until they bleed. We don't have nice things here because we aren't willing to do what is required to maintain them. So, you know, with statements like that, I kind of have to question your public policy beliefs. And, you know, and you also stated there'd been no studies. Well, I'm sitting here holding a study from the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, from the University of Pittsburgh about the uh, suicidal disparities between transgender and cisgender uh, adults and children. Uh, so I think, you know, before you state things, you may need to know all the facts. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, is that, can I respond? Uh, Chairman Williams, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make motion to go back out of session or back into session. Thank you. Is there an objection? All right. There is, there is, would you withdraw? My. Um, yes, I will withdraw. Okay. All right. Is there any further questions for Mr. Walsh? Okay. See none. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Representative Clemens, who would you like to call up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'm. I just have a single question for. I think 
the name was Prisha. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Representative Clemens, you are recognized. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for coming to testify today. We appreciate it. I'm, I'm curious, where did you receive your medical care? North Carolina. North Carolina. And did you have to receive any counseling or psychological evaluations or get permission of both adults or anything before you had that procedure at that time? You're recognized. Um, I was in therapy for the anorexia for a while and trying to get help for the cutting. But um, when I said gender, the dialectical behavioral therapy was stopped and um, the other psychotherapy was stopped and I was fast tracked to medicalization. And both of my parents were told, your child has already tried to attempt suicide. If you don't affirm her, she'll succeed next time and it'll be your fault. Representative Clemens, you recognize? And that was in North Carolina? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Chairman Farmer, you recognize? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thanks again for you being here today. Now, how old were you when you uh, started the process of transitioning or this, when, when you said that uh, your, the doctor told your parents that if you don't transition or affirm your transition that you would end up killing yourself? You're recognized. I uh, started believing I was transgender at 15. The testosterone started at 17. Okay. And Chairman Farmer. Thank you. Right. Do, you think, do you think you would have had a, things could have, in your opinion, because your life, you lived it, you made those decisions, or someone made those decisions for you, I guess. Do you think that if you had the opportunity to become the age of majority, 18 years old, do you think that that uh, you would have made a different decision or have been able to make that decision for yourself? You're recognized. Um, yes, it's a slightly complicated answer because of how quick gender affirming care was and in comparison how difficult it is to get preventative psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think more time would have given me the ability to find the correct therapy and therapist that I needed, um, but not being rushed would have helped a lot too. Chairman Farmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to say one thing. You had made the comment that you're ugly. You're not ugly. You're beautiful. And we appreciate you for being here in front of us today. You're helping many Tennesseans, many young folks, helping us get this uh, initiative and this policy passed. But uh, you, you don't ever need to... Ever, ever, don't even think you're ugly at all. You are absolutely not. You are absolutely beautiful. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, Chairman Kumar, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Dr. Hamada. I'll, I'll, uh, if there's no more for Ms. Mosley, uh, Dr. Hamada. Okay. Hey, Dr. Kumar, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Amara, for taking the time and courage to come and speak on this subject. My pleasure. As a physician of multiple specialties and also as a socially active citizen, are you concerned that many of our large national organizations, professional societies are politicized and are putting out recommendations that are self-serving to their domain. Uh, I think it's uh, it really, as a professionals who belong to some of these societies, we should be very concerned, and I wanted your opinion about it. Dr. Amata. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Yes, I am very concerned about the hard left turn that many of these organizations have taken from the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, pediatrics, OBGYN, family medicine, internal medicine, et cetera. Um, they only represent uh, the aggressive um, gender transformations uh, of children, and they do not put any type of brakes on with regards to allowing them to mature throughout childhood until they can make some uh, more knowledgeable decisions. Um, so I feel like these organizations do not represent me, and they do not, even though I'm a member of a couple of them, and they do not represent many physicians in the United States because I feel like they have an agenda that's politicized. Thank you, thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, uh, Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Romano, very good to see you. Thank you. I, and I'm, I'm gonna just drop a question on you because you being a medical doctor, I, I, you might have studied this. In the past few weeks, I've been studying what's going on in European countries and the entire medical 
people in Great Britain are starting to walk back. They've actually dissolved the transgender clinic in Great Britain because um, they see some issues, obviously. And, I, and I'm wondering, do you have any knowledge of that? Have you seen what's going on in Europe? Can you speak to this committee from a standpoint of a doctor and what you've seen in these health institutes? Certainly. Dr. Uh, Mata, Representative Faison, uh, thank you. Um, Amazingly, liberal Europe has, let, let me just say the United States has, has severely exceeded even what liberal Europe has done on many uh, facets, whether it's gender transformation or the issues of life or the issues of euthanasia, et cetera. Um, I don't know what the problem is, but it seems like here in the United States, we are rushing uh, to extreme positions. And with regards to this in particular, uh, the UK, Sweden, and Finland have actually put the brakes on uh, with regards to these gender transitions in our pediatric population. Chairman Faison, you good? All right. Uh, Representative Clemens, you recognize? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I, I, I got to take issue with your position about these European countries. I think what you just said about Finland is actually completely false. What part? And, well, you just said that they put the brakes on this entirely. Is that accurate? Are you going to sit here and testify to this committee that Finland just put the brakes on this care entirely? From what I understand, they have slowed down. They have not. They have. Uh, they were fast tracking things like this, but from what I understand, they have. Now they put the now they're on. slowing down. They hadn't put the brakes on it. Putting brakes on slows you down. <laughs> Representative Clemens, you're recognized. So. Gender-affirming care is available in those countries, according to my research. Um, this includes both puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapy for those 16 or older. Um, in, in Finland, um, what I've seen or what I've read uh, is that they're expanding their gender-affirming care to primary care providers, making it more accessible. Finland has actually formally legalized the ability for its citizens to change their gender by simply stating it and discontinuing their mandatory sterilization of individuals prior to doing so. Does that line up with your research? It doesn't. But I've not been to Finland. I'm getting my information from the Heritage Foundation. So I, I assume that they have That's done true. significant amounts of research on that. Uh, Rums of comments, you recognize? Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so what was your, are, are you a pediatric, what was your specialty? Dr. Hamada. I am board certified in, uh, I can't even talk, obstetrics and gynecology as well as family medicine with a focus on sports medicine as well. Representative Clemens. No endocrinology or pediatrics? Uh, that's part, well, pediatrics is part of family medicine, family medicine, and then also uh, with regards to endocrinology, that's a big portion of what we do in obstetrics and gynecology. And what's your formal training in that? Um, four years of medical school and residency with uh, oral and written boards and continued maintenance of certification. You're recognized. Did you do any residency in the endocrinology? You're no. Recognized. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Representative Mitchell, you're recognized. Yeah, doctor. Uh, first and foremost, thanks for your service to the country. Uh, but you, you said, you know, these associations and organizations like the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, all I've got letters, you know, advocating for gender affirming care and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services calling it crucial to the overall health and well-being for transgender youth. Are all of these organizations wrong? Dr. Amato? In my opinion, yes, they are very wrong. Okay. <laughs> thank okay. you. And any You're further welcome. questions for Dr. Amato? Okay. Say none. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for our panel? All right. Say none. Without objection, we'll go back into session. Leader Lambert, you're recognized.
Committee, thank you very much. And, and I want to thank everybody that testified. This is obviously a very passionate and difficult issue that we grapple with as a society. So thank you all for committee members for even considering this bill. And again, I want to thank everybody that testified. These folks feel very passionate about this issue on both sides of it. Um, the, the question that was asked earlier, while might not have been made in the way that we would normally ask it, but it was asked to a member of this committee, do, do you agree with these hormone blockers, puberty blockers, these hormones, puberty blockers, or surgery being conducted on a child, someone under 18? It, that is the question on how you vote today. Do, do you agree with that or not? I mean, that, that is what we're doing. So when you look at all the rest of this, and we've heard the testimony from now both medical professionals, from citizens that are, at, at, you know, passionate about this and from children, and quite frankly, children on both sides of this. This bill at its core is very straightforward, okay? Every other treatment that has always worked, the, the, the treatment that these children need is absolutely not only still on the table, but encouraged, permitted, and the way we should go on this as a society. It's what's always worked. When you have a child that is not comfortable with their adolescent body as it develops, that child gets the love, support, and yes, many times mental health treatment that they need to transition through adolescence to become adults. And then they can decide whatever they want to do. But when we're dealing with children, it is simply not good practice and not good policy uh, to, to have doctors that will cut parts of their body off or give them hormones or puberty blockers that do change them forever and do have horrible side effects. So I'm going to keep this short. The amendment specifically, I know several of you were on the subcommittee. Um, it, there were several questions about, there was a section in this bill um, that dealt with abuse and neglect if parents um, permitted their children to undergo these type of procedures. That has been removed from this bill. Um, there was a lot of conversation back and forth in the subcommittee on this. And quite frankly, the goal of this bill, the reason I filed it, and with all due respect to the person that said copy and paste, obviously they don't know me. Um, we've spent months and months and months on this bill talking to multiple interested parties to try to get a Tennessee, a Tennessee way to address this particular issue. And in that, I, in hearing from the parent that testified today and from many others out there, many parents, they go to the doctor with their child and their child is in an extraordinarily difficult position and they just want a doctor to tell them how to make it better. That's it. They just want their kid to be healthy and happy and to be fine. So we, we took out the abuse and neglect part of this, and it's simply not a part of the bill. Um, beyond that, I do want to say that everything that was said about suicidal ideation is right on the money. These children struggle with suicidal ideation. These children are going to struggle with suicidal ideation. Every study has shown that. Whether they go through the surgeries, whether they have the puberty blockers or hormones, or whether they do not. They are children that many times deal with dual diagnoses, multiple diagnoses. This isn't the only thing. There is not a silver bullet to resolve what they are going through. This bill allows for everything else except for the irreversible puberty blockers, hormones, and surgeries for those under 18. Mr. Chairman, I stand ready for questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Clemens, you're recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. First of all, Mr. Uh, uh, Leader, I appreciate you taking out the criminalization component. Um, however, I, of course, still have some concerns with this legislation. You know, first and foremost, I think my colleague here had requested, you know, if we just deal with the surgical aspect rather than the hormonal aspects, I think this would be an entirely different conversation, but we've kind of thrown the kitchen sink in here and that raises some concerns. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to, touch on on the surgical aspects first because i believe what i saw last week was and you can correct me if i'm wrong was the defeat of an amendment and i think you opposed it as well from the well um or considered a not friendly amendment that would ban optional cosmetic surgeries for minors um that clearly result in physical removal of body parts um, that are irreversible. And so you've got gynecomastia, removal of breast tissue, you got rhinoplasty, removal of bone, cartilage, skin, you got circumcisions, you've got even micropenis syndrome where you have hormonal treatment at a as an infant. You don't have a problem with any of those, but you just you just want to limit it to the specific group of people 
Is that right? Little Lambert, you recognize? Sir, you, you're a learned attorney. You read these bills the same as I do. You know what the bill says. I've sponsored this bill to address this issue. If you want to sponsor a bill to address all the rest of those issues that you just mentioned, feel free. We all get elected to represent our constituents. This is the bill before you. Uh, Representative Clemens, you recognize? I, th thank you. I, I don't want to go around and around about this. It, it's a simple yes or no question. Do you think that those optional procedures should be allowed or are you just targeting the specific group of individuals who receive similar treatment just for a select purpose with which you disagree? That's that's all I want. Leader Lambert. So there is nothing about this that is this that is just yes or no. I understand that you want it to be that simple and you can get as frustrated or make as many faces if you want to. And I will be respectful, sir. You can smirk. You can laugh just as you did at many of the witnesses. This bill deals with exactly what I said it deals with. If you don't like it, the answer is to vote against it, not to demean these folks or anybody else that has any other condition. Representative Clemens. Okay. You know, if, if we're not asking a yes or no question, why are you not addressing those optional surgeries and only these? You recognize. Thank you. And thank you for asking a question that is about this bill. This bill deals with the fact that we're not going to be, if this bill passes a surgery first or a hormone or puberty blocker first state, everything else should be tried before someone gets to that point. That's what the data shows. That's what the, the actual scientific evidence shows. Mental health treatment, love, support, guiding these children through adolescence, at least to the point where they get to 18. There is no evidence that surgery alone or puberty blockers or hormone treatments alone actually resolve their issues. But these children and their parents, quite frankly, are being lied to. They're being told this one silver bullet will do it. That's why I brought this bill. All right. Representative Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I would love to ask some specific questions about the bill, but the sponsor keeps raising these issues. I don't, I don't think the actual standard of care right now in Tennessee is surgery first. From what I have learned by speaking with people who actually know what they're talking about and perform these type of treatment, there is a great deal of counseling, a great deal of psychological evaluation, a lot of input from the parents, re requiring consent from both parents, regardless of the situation. There is an extensive process that these families go through, not just the child, the families go through this together. And so this is not a surgery first state. I think that's a, a, a just patently false statement and, and, and really does an injustice to, the, to the, the children and the families who have gone through this. Now, with respect to the issue with, I think the statement was made about the, the suicidal stuff, I think was brought up earlier. You know, that isn't a result of these children um, this isn't a mental illness we're dealing with here. The, the, the suicide and those threats to mental illness come from third parties. We are the ones who are creating the problem for those children. And that's what results in, in the suicide rates and the mental health issues. And so I think we need to be very aware of that. Now, with that being said, I've got a question about this grandfathering clause in here. Um, you've got March 31st of 2024 in section um, it's B1B of, uh, it's on page six, top mm -hmm. of page six of your amendment that makes the bill. I'm curious about, you're allowing children to stay on these hormones, but forces them to detransition de by March 31st of 2024. Are you concerned about the medical problem that may create for some of these children? You recognize. Thank you, sir. And specifically in the language of this bill, we are concerned to, that any type of hard stop date at the very beginning of this without any type of stair step down could potentially cause problems. These children are on harmful hormones and puberty blockers, and it does take time. So the time between July 1st and March 31st would be the time that if medically necessary, those children could be stair-stepped off of these dangerous drugs. Beyond March 31st, that would no longer be an option. That was clarified between the two 
again, between sub and full, um, there's a couple of words that are changed in that to ensure that March 31st is a hard stop on this. Again, to be clear, these children that are already on hormones and puberty blockers are being harmed by them. The side effects on those, we wouldn't lengthen subcommittee on that, exist. It, it, it's not made up. It's right there on the packaging. These were not designed in many cases to be utilized like this. But when they are used, we want to make sure there's at least a buffer there so that the doctors can actually look at those patients and make a determination between July 1st and March 31st for those that had started these um, substances prior to July 1st that they have until March 31st for a treatment regimen that will work for them. Representative Clemens. Um, Mr. Chairman, I may have more questions. Um, let me get my notes together, but I just want to make one last one final plea. If, if you'd consider separating out the hormonal treatment and from the bill and, and leave it a surgical bill, I think that would be a, an entirely different conversation. Um, so that's my last request on that respect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mitchell, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And like I've told you in subcommittee, we we agree mostly on the surgery surgery aspect of this. Because like I said, I don't think too many genital surgeries are occurring or any are occurring on someone under 18. But I've just got a scenario to ask you, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how how your bill is going to figure this out. So say you got a 16-year-old child. She wants breast reduction because she wants smaller breasts. But then you got another 16-year-old child that wants smaller breasts because she wants to identify as a, as a male. And then you got another 16-year-old child that has history of breast cancer in the family. And it would be best for, for the uh, surgery. So how are, how's your bill going to figure out intent in those three situations? Uh, Lear, your uh, Lambert, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, it, it's very clear in the language of the bill. So medical procedure means surgical, surgically removing, modifying, altering, or entering into tissues, cavities, or organs of a human being, or prescribing, administrating, or dispensing any puberty blocker or hormone to a human being. And then in the prohibitions, a healthcare provider shall not knowingly perform or offer to perform on a minor or administer or offer to administer a minor a medical procedure if the performance of administration of the procedure is for the purpose of, and it goes directly to for what the purpose is. What's the purpose of? Enabling a minor to identify, identify with or live as a purported identity inconsistent with the minor's sex or treating purported discomfort or distress from discordance between the minor's sex and asserted identity. And then it goes on with the exceptions beyond that. Uh, Representative Mitchell, you recognize? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so you're saying, you know, if someone just comes in and just lies to the physician, to the plastic surgeon, it's okay. So that's what you're setting up. Am I am I correct in that? Uh, you recognize? No, sir. That's what you're saying. What I said was the language of the bill. <laughs> well, but I'm talking about realities, and and that's what's going to happen. But again, you know, committee, again. We went through this last week. The surgery aspect of his bill is fine. Let's pass that. But when you get to these hormone therapy and puberty blockers and things like that, that's where it comes into the area where Representative Faison up there suggested, I don't want to be part of anything that's going to increase the suicide rate in children in this state. Uh, you know, I'm reading here from Health and Human Services, puberty blockers, reversible, uh, hormone therapy, reversible, uh, gender affirming surgeries, not reversible. So I think, you know, we can put a hold on something until somebody turns 18 that's not reversible. But the others, folks, I, I don't want to be a part of of raising the suicide rate in this state, especially for a child. And we're getting into an area where we're, we're hearing a lot of testimony from people who are not doctors, who are not psychologists, who are not psychiatrists, but they're getting a lot of clicks. And that's not how we do legislation in this state. We look out for the well-being of the citizens of this state, especially the children. 
And I think part of his bill does that. Part of his bill harms children. So I, I think this committee needs to do the right thing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Leader Lamberth, you can respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With all due respect, sir, a portion of what you said is just absolutely inaccurate. And this is not an opinion. This is fact. You may want to take it and spin it some other way. I, I understand that you're very adept at, at, at advocating for your position. You always have been. A 2011 study that examined a 30-year outcome revealed 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, the suicide rate of those who had undergone sex reassignment surgery rose to 20 times that of comparable peers. These children are being lied to. We do agree, at least, on the surgical aspect of this. The hormones and the puberty blockers, you, you've heard from two different people, of what that causes to them, the, the actual pain, the side effects, the mental anguish that it causes from them that is not being fully explained by every doctor. And I won't throw them all into the same basket. It's not too much to ask so that the suicidal ideation rate does not increase in these children, that they wait till at least 18. We're talking a couple of years here for most of them so they can go through adolescence. And here's the other reason. There's plenty of other evidence that at least 10, there's 10 separate studies, and I can get you all this as much as you'd like, that indicates more than 80% of the children who meet the, this criteria for gender affirming care will outgrow gender dysphoria and embrace their biological sex. We just need to give them time and give them the support and the, and the love and the mental health treatment that they need. And it is a mental health condition. It has always been a mental health condition. It is about how you feel about your body. The best outcome is that you feel comfortable in your body. And then that actually does reduce suicidal ideation. So at the end of the day, that's all I'm asking of this committee. Let's at least wait to their adults. Representative Hemmer, you're recognized. I'm going on. Representative, Representative Hemmer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Leader. I was curious uh, from your research, is there, I know you said there's no silver bullet, but is there any best practices or uh, or other evidence-based guidelines that, that can and does help this population? Leader, you recognize? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for asking that question. Again, mental health, support, identifying what the problem is. I mean, actually spending months and even years with these children through those therapy sessions, just as we heard testimony today, to see if there is another diagnosis that is driving this thought process. Some, sometimes it is autism. That is one of the most misdiagnoses um, that occurs many times when a child goes into a doctor's office and, and they're diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Many times it's actually autism and somewhere on that spectrum. Um, other times it's any variety of other issues that have come up. Sometimes it can be triggered by, as, as we heard testimony from, um, something that has happened to that child, sometimes an abuse or an attack or something else that has occurred. But in mental health treatment for as long as possible before you go into surgical intervention or medical intervention is absolutely the tried and true practice and what other countries are starting to move back toward. All right. Thank you. Good. All right. Um, Chairman Williams, you're recognized. Question on the bill. All right. Question has been called on the bill. Seeing no objection, we are voting on House Bill 1. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Ayes have it. Bill goes on to civil justice. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. All right. Thank you. Um, before we adjourn, I personally would like to thank all those that came and testified. I think uh, particularly those that have been patients. Uh, shows a lot of courage, and I appreciate your coming and, and participating in this um, uh, in this process. And if you want to have your vote recorded as a no, please notify the clerk. Seeing no further business uh, before us, uh, we are adjourned.